Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode 248, recorded Monday, May 2nd, 2016, The Confidence Game. Triangulation is brought to you by DigitalOcean, simple and fast cloud hosting built for developers. Deploy an SSD cloud server in 55 seconds. Try it today for free. Visit DigitalOcean.com, and once you sign up, be sure to enter the promo code TRIANGULATION in the billing section to get your $10 credit. And by... Curiosity Stream, a subscription streaming service that offers over 1,400 documentaries and nonfiction series from the world's best filmmakers. Get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month. But for you, the first two months completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com slash twit and use the offer code twit. It's time for Triangulation, the show where we get together with some of the most interesting people in technology and in this case, in psychology, and uh, talk about the world around us. Joining us right now, Maria Konnikova. She's the author of a, a new book called The Confidence Game and Why We Fall For It Every Time. Maria, thank you for uh, joining me on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So this is great because everybody who is on the Internet these days has experienced, you know, the scam email, the Nigerian prince who has money and wants to give it to you, if only you would just send him an email back. Uh, and many more. In fact, that's when I first came across uh, your work, is an article you'd, you wrote on the, the kind of the origins of the Nigerian confidence game. Let me tell me about your background. You're a journalist, but you're also a psychologist. Is that right? Um, I am. I am. Um, it is right. I got a PhD in psychology, um, so I'm not a clinical psychologist. Um, a lot of people make that mistake, so I can't treat you or diagnose you. I wasn't going to um, ask but you, I can run... it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, but, but I you can know, run steps yeah, and you understand the psychology of uh, the confidence game, which yeah. I think the subtitle tells us why we fall for it every time. There's nothing new under the sun, is there? By the way, this is the audible version, so... Uh, at which uh, Maria narrates herself. So if you uh, are all inclined, we have a lot of audible listeners uh, on the podcast. This would be a great way to read the book. How did you come to this subject? I originally came to it actually by a David Mamet. Um, I watched his film House of Games. Yes. Um, yes. And <laughs> it's, it's a really beautiful movie for those of you who haven't seen it. Um, is a really intelligent woman. She's a psychologist. Sounds a bit familiar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but she's actually a clinical psychologist. Um, she treats patients. And so she is someone who should really know about human nature. And yet she ends up falling for this really insane long con. I won't spoil it for people, but it doesn't end well. So I watched this and I thought, how does someone that smart fall for something like that? It's a fictional movie, but does that happen in real life? Because that's not the way that I normally think of victims. I normally think, you know, oh, they're gullible or some, something went wrong. And this made me realize that, no, actually, some victims um, are people who in every respect should know better, and yet they still fall for this. And I realized that no one had ever explored that. So I went down a three-year-long rabbit hole, um, and this book came out the other side. It's We are fascinated by cons. I mean, I think of not just... Uh the Mammoth movie, but also The Sting, which is another long con. Um, there are a lot of movies and books about con artists. And why is it that we're so fascinated by this? Well, I think part of it is that they're artists. I mean, the name itself yeah. gives us part of the answer. They're incredibly good at what they do. They're not, you know, people who hold you up at gunpoint, who break into your house, who steal stuff, they manage to gain your trust. That's actually the origin of the term confidence man. Um, there was a man, William Thompson, in 1800s Manhattan, and he would come up to people and say, have you the confidence in me to lend me your watch until tomorrow? And he was dressed as a very dapper gentleman. He would approach other likewise dapper gentlemen, and people gave him their watch because, you know, there was so much at stake. You know, are you 
you a gentleman? Do you abide by the gentleman's code? What kind of a society do you live in? How do you think of people? And and so by the time he was caught, he had quite the collection of watches to his name. <laughs> and <laughs> that was the origin of confidence, man. You give me your confidence. Have you confidence in me? I don't take anything for you from you. I make you kind of complicit in your own undoing. And there's something really really i think attractive about that it's appealing it makes you value the artistry of what they do Uh, and i think the other part of it is we tend to see it often as victimless crimes even though it's not we forget that there are people whose lives are ruined on the other side we just look at the craft and we say wow that's so great look at what this person was able to do um because there's no blood and gore it's very easy to disregard the fact that actually yes people were taken advantage of I think, uh, at least uh, for me, I also, I also think that part of the problem is uh, we blame the victim a little bit because in most cases, confidence games prey upon their own greed, right? Yeah. So, so we do definitely, as a society, blame the victim wrongly um, because we do tend to assume that it has to do with greed and it doesn't um, at least most of the time it does not it's greed of a very different kind it's you know it's it's just it's deep human desire and it's not necessarily about money in fact most cons um, we have a very false perception of this as a society that it's all about money but a lot of con artists aren't motivated by greed either um, one of the people I write about in the book, Ferdinand Waldo de Mara, he's one of the protagonists of my book, The Great Imposter. He impersonated surgeons, doctors. He founded a religious college. He was a professor. He was a prison warden in Texas. He almost got a contract to build a bridge um, in Mexico. I mean, I can't imagine what would have happened if he'd actually gotten that contract. Um, but he was always perpetually he didn't make money off of this it was about reputation it was about power so for his victims it also wasn't about being greedy it was about that connection about helping out someone um making a friend you know needing something and i think that perhaps miss victims we say you know oh you can't fool an honest man or they were greedy or they were gullible very wrong um a lot of victims are honest a lot of them have no greed um and i always point people also to sweetheart scams that's those romance scams where people um end up falling in love with someone online and then that person disappears i mean where's the greed in that you just you thought you were in a relationship and then there goes your life it's interesting that you by the way there was another movie about uh, damara the great imposter tony curtis plays by the damara and uh, maybe others remember the movie catch me if you can which is a story of frank abnegale i remember interviewing frank when his book catch me if you can came out these guys are very engaging and what's interesting is they don't they don't really make money often i mean abnegal uh, was was kiting checks he was forging checks and things but really it seems more about the adventure than anything else um what is the motivation behind the con man you know that's a really excellent question and i think that at the end of the day it's about power it's yeah. about that sense of control over other people's rush that comes with getting away with something and being the person who knows that you got away with it and no one else realizes what happened they don't realize they were victims they don't realize they were taken advantage of um and that's a huge rush so a lot of people are an imposter had the option of going straight many many times it could have been very successful um and quite lucrative careers and they don't take it because i think they're a bit like addicts once you once you taste that power it's really difficult to decide you know what um i'm going to give it back um getting away with something can be quite the rush in your research for this did you uh, interview con artists I did. Um, I interviewed quite a number of con artists and I discovered um, that a lot of them really were just ordinary people, you know, like your boy or girl next door. Um, They're friendly. They're wonderful. Um, They know so much about you. They really do their research. Um, They're really charismatic. They're not someone who you think of as a criminal um, at all. I mean, I would never have picked them out from a room other than as, oh, look, this is someone who's just really, really nice. Yeah. Um, 
And I ended up having to, about halfway through my research, I ended up no longer interviewing them um, um, because I realized that they were conning me. They're dangerous. Are they psychopaths in the classic sense? Some of them are. Um, I, I read about something called the dark traits, and these are traits that con artists possess at least some um, and sometimes all of. And the first of the dark triad is actually the... That's the lack of empathy, um, the inability to experience emotions the way that other people experience emotions. And the way that that helps con artists be con artists is actually twofold. First of all, you feel no remorse. You don't feel guilt. So you're able to take advantage of people um, quite brazenly and you don't actually care. That's why, you know, if you look at the vocabulary of con artists, they often call their victims marks. Um, and that's a very term. Uh, you know, you're a walking target. You're not actually um, someone who's a human being. And so that's that's one part of it. And the other part is it actually, being a psychopath, enables you to experience a very specific kind of empathy. We normally associate empathy with emotion, but there's a very cold, logical, rational empathy that's all about seeing the world from somebody else's perspective. Um, and your own emotions can actually get in the way with that sort of empathy. So con artists are really wonderful at listening and at figuring out exactly what it is people want. And that often comes from psychopathy. There's this great con artist, Victor Lustig, in the 20th century. He sold the Eiffel Tower um, a few times. <laughs> um, I thought those things were jokes. You wanna buy the Brooklyn Bridge. I thought nobody would fall for that. No, he, he managed to do it twice to very famous industrialists. Oh. He convinced them that it was being sold for scrap metal um, because um, it was during the war. France was experiencing a lot of um, financial upheaval. And so people actually bought this. They thought, oh, um, you know, okay, I guess they're going to make money off the Eiffel Tower. Holy so He was very good. And he wrote called the Ten Commandments. <laughs> he wrote something called the Ten Commandments of the con artist. Um, and one of them is a con artist isn't a good talker. A con artist is a good listener. And I think that gets at the heart of what a good con artist does and explains why a lot of them are psychopaths. Psychopathy really allows you to listen. But then there are the other two traits of the dark triad, which are actually more common. Psychopathy is pretty rare, just in general. There aren't that many psychopaths in the world. And the other two are narcissism and Machiavellianism. Mm. Um, narcissism is this overblown sense of self, but also a sense of entitlement. And so you end up thinking that you deserve everything. And so you don't think you're actually doing anything wrong. You just think you're writing the world. So someone like Damara, he stole credentials. You know, he became a PhD, he became a doctor. And he, his rationale was simple, I'm smarter than they are. Why in the world would I go to school for eight years? Um, I should just take it, I deserve it more. Um, Frank Abagnale, I'm sure, did something quite similar. Um, and then, so that's also kind of a rationalization type of tool. Final one, which I think every con artist has to have, is Machiavellianism. And that's from Machiavelli's ideal prince. That's the art of persuasion and manipulation. So I manipulate you into doing exactly what I want you to do, but you have no idea you've been manipulated. You actually think that you're doing it of your own free will. It's this beautiful soft skill. And that's what enables confidence artists to really make people go along with this because they think it's really their own idea. They're so good at persuading, at convincing, at getting people to go against their best interest while all the, all the while thinking that they're going in their best interest. It's quite extraordinary to watch. I can understand how somebody as a child, you know, uh, I know a lot of magicians and it starts in your childhood and you do tricks and there's a power that you get when you're able to do those tricks and people go, oh, and that a comedian has the same kind of experience, the power of mm -hmm. eliciting an emotion from somebody. And I could see how that's addicting, but I also can see that most people <laughs> would go, but I'm not gonna take advantage of somebody just because I have that power. I might get some pleasure out of making somebody laugh or gasp at a trick, but there is that next step, and I guess that's where the dark triad has to come in, that you go to actually taking advantage of people. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And what I write about in the book is that um, 
con artists are not born, they're made. Um, it's really, there. there is a combination of predisposition and opportunity. So you have to have that dark triad predisposition because in the exact same uh, set of circumstances, some people are just free, they will turn to that sort of willful deception while others won't. Um, and by the same token, there are people who can have a lot of the dark triad and become, you know, very functional members um, of society. They're kind well, of Well, I think if somebody of somebody like Steve Jobs who you know, probably had at least two out of the three traits, um, but managed to turn it uh, to something that was a con contribution uh, to society. That's, yeah, that's absolutely right. And I think what we need to understand is that the tools that con artists use are used by a lot of legitimate professions. And there is a lot of overlap. And so you end up seeing, so for instance, one of the tools that the con artists use most frequently is their Bible, kind of their playbook. And that's Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People, which is also a perennial bestseller for them because those are the techniques of persuasion, um, the techniques of friendship building. Right. And those are a lot of the same techniques that you use to take advantage of people. So the tools often don't change. It's how you use them. What's your intent? Are you Steve Jobs who's going to do it to try to make the world a better place? Or are you Frank Abagnale? Are you Damara right. um, who's going to do it to really pull one over on people? Is there a common childhood experience that uh, can turn somebody into a con artist? Are they abused as um, children? No, no. I think that 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 would be really nice and neat yeah. um, if we if we could if we could do something like that. They do often, uh, some of them will experience some sort of stress. So Damara, for instance, um, he grew up originally in a wealthy family in Lawrence, Massachusetts, and then his dad lost his job, and they ended up moving to the poor part of town. And Damara really, really didn't want to be poor. He'd never been poor in his life. Um, and so he you know, started feeling incredibly uncomfortable. And then his sister, his older sister, with whom he was very close died in a freak accident she went ice skating fell um, hit her head had a brain hemorrhage and died and so here's this guy um, who loses his best friend um, who's suddenly poor and lo and behold a few months later is when he pulls off his first con and then he after that he doesn't turn back he drops school um, and becomes a full-time con artist so sure people like that have that sort of experience but then you have people like um, you know I uh, like Cassie Chadwick, um, just because I want to make sure people realize that women can be con artists as well. <laughs> um, and she impersonated um, a Rockefeller and she ended up, sorry, not a Rockefeller, a Carnegie. Clark Rockefeller was the Rockefeller impersonator. People love impersonating <laughs> these. Uh, it's another, another very common con game, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> yes, it yeah. really is. And I think and of she, The Incredible Mr. Ripley, another yes. movie about another kind of con. Absolutely, absolutely. So Cassie Chadwick never had anything bad to her. And lots of them who just, you know, they get into the right um, situation and they decide, hmm, you know, this will be good, this will work. Um, and, and then they end up becoming con artists. So when I say... Um, when I say opportunity, I do mean that some people, you know, they nothing bad has ever happened to them, and yet then they get into an environment where this type of behavior is permissible or where they end up realizing somehow that they can get away with it. I'm thinking of some journalists who per, uh, perpetrate cons, who make up stories, make up facts, make up sources. There are some very famous ones. One of them even won a Pulitzer Prize, right. Um, right. Which, was, <laughs> which was then taken take in a way. Um, but then you, you start small and you see, hey, no one checked me. I got away with it. Um, and then all of a sudden you're fabricating an entire story. When you think of somebody like Jason Blair, you wonder how did they possibly think they could get away with it? So there's also a certain amount of delusion that goes along with this. And maybe that goes back to the narcissism of thinking, I'm the smartest guy in the room. They'll never catch me because I can outwit them. Yeah, I think it. And it's not necessarily even delusion. It looks like delusion in retrospect because you say, how in the world did you expect to get away with this? But then if you look at the evolution, you see that they didn't start by just full-on fabrications. They started small. You know, they started with, you know, a little fact or they made up a source or they said they were one place, but they were really in another. But the story was more or less accurate and they get away with it and they keep getting away with it. Snowballs. So people... Yeah. 
Exactly. So by the time we're introduced, to it. Um, we, we look at it, how did you ever think this could work? But there was a very long path toward that. So one of the famous recent examples, Jonah Lehrer, he was caught fabricating Bob Dylan quotes and people thought, are you insane? Dylan is still alive. And Bob Dylan fans, well, they're going to fact check you. Then you look at his record and he's been doing this for years. Yeah. And this is the first time anyone's caught him. We're talking to Maria Konnikova. She's the author of a, of a new book, came out in January called uh, The Confidence Game. And I, 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 there is, this is an endlessly fascinating subject. I want, we're going to take a break and, and come back. But I also think you're a fascinating subject. Born in Moscow, your English is impeccable, but you did come here when you were young. You were four years old. Uh, cum laude from Harvard. Uh, I mean, r writer for The New Yorker. The, your previous book was a huge bestseller, Mastermind, How to Think Like uh, Sherlock Holmes. Um, I've read your work in uh, The Atlantic and Scientific American. I'm just thrilled to be able to talk to you uh, and wired. Let's not forget that. Uh, I do want to. <laughs> I do want to talk about uh, the uh, the Niger the four one nine scam, the Nigerian prince scam, because it has an old and interesting history, which you were able to dig up. Uh, we're gonna have more with Maria Konnikova in just a bit, but our sh first a word from our sponsor. Let me sell you on DigitalOcean. You're gonna love it. These guys are great. No, actually, they really are great. I love it. Uh, so. DigitalOcean is for developers or anybody who wants to try web technologies, set up a server. Uh, it, I, you know what, I'm gonna, let me get my laptop because I want to show you how easy it is to create a DigitalOcean server. You get it provisioned in under a minute and they have all of the operating systems you would want, all of the software or much of the software you'd want to use in one click of the mouse. These are virtual private servers. They can be customized and deployed easily. They can host websites. They can host web apps, production applications, personal projects, virtual desktops, almost anything you could think of. Of course, you get full root access. It's yours. It's your server. 600,000 developers now use it. This is the fastest growing, the fastest growing cloud hosting for developers out there. Robert Balasser has a, an account. Randall Schwartz, Aaron Newcomb, I do. If you want to play with Docker, if you want to play with WordPress, you could Drupal, Node.js. I use it for closure. It's so great. Now, let me show you. So I've logged into my account. I am going to create and provision a server in, in literally in seconds. So you start with which image do you want? And you can have Ubuntu and a variety of versions, FreeBSD, Fedora, Debian, CoreOS, and CentOS. But look at this. You can also... Do apps. So if you want to set up Docker or Drone, Joomla or MongoDB, you want to play with MediaWiki, you want to create a Mumble server or a Redis, WordPress, Ruby on Rails. You know, let's say you want to learn Ruby on Rails. And really, in order to learn this, you want to have a server. You set it up with one click of the mouse. So I'm going to say it's going to be a, it's going to be a Ruby on Rails server. Choose your size. And you can either have it be 7 tenths of a cent an hour or $5 a month depending on how you want to scale it. Start with the smallest. If it suddenly becomes popular or you want to have more users or a bigger database, it's easy to increase the size of the existing server. Choose your data center. Look at they're all over the world. I'm going to choose the one nearest me. You could choose to have backups, uh, IPv6 if you want, private networking. Uh, I always use my uh, login key from SSH, my, my, uh, my uh, PGP key, that way, my SSH key. That way it makes it so it's easy to log in. Are you ready? I'm going to carry one droplet. Uh, let's leave the host name as is, although you can name it anything you want. Let's call it, all right, we'll do this, Leo's Ruby. And now watch, I'm going to press the button create. Now before we're done... This droplet will be created. The server will be provisioned. It will be ready to go online, and I can now start writing my web app or putting my blog up. It, you know why it's so fast? 100% SSDs, state-of-the-art data centers all over the world. There's one near you. You can use floating IPs for high availability. You can use automated deployment via API. You don't have to press any buttons. Great community. In fact, there are pages on every kind of thing. You want to de deploy Django or set up a mail server? There's a page there. It's done. It's done. I am now running my server here. And you can see exactly uh, how it's working. The droplet is created. I can go right to the console and log in, start using it, start messing with it. This is incredible. I love it. 
Digital Ocean, folks. If you are a developer, you want to learn to develop, which is, by the way, a big deal. Uh, to have your own server is a great thing. Then you want to try this. Go to digitalocean.com. Sign up for an account. Once you confirm your email, you know, your account is good to go. Go to the billing section and use our promo code triangulation. That's going to give you a free $10 credit. That's two months, okay, of, of, a, of a simple server. Plenty to get started and explore what DigitalOcean can do. DigitalOcean.com. Remember, set up the account now and uh, in the billing section, put the offer code triangulation to get $10 for free. It is, this is amazing. We, are in, we live in amazing times. DigitalOcean.com. We're back with more. Uh, Maria Konnikova is our guest. She's the author of a new book, The Confidence Game. Just came out from Penguin, and I also should point out it's available on Audible.com. And after talking to you for five minutes, I already bought the book, Maria. I was hoping that the publisher would send me one. They didn't. <laughs> but now I've got to read it because this is fascinating stuff. I'm also intrigued by the fact that you actually had to stop talking to con artists. What were they trying to con you out of? They weren't trying to con me out of, well, they were trying to con me out of writing anything bad about them, mm. I think <laughs> I yeah. think is the bottom yeah. line. Um, because when you talk to them, you really are taken in. And I knew I was dealing with con artists. That's the crazy thing. I mean, it's not like these were random people on the street. I was talking to them with a purpose. You are a con artist. Let's, you know, let's talk. So I knew exactly who they were. And yet I still found myself just being really taken in by their charisma, by the, their ways of just insinuating themselves into your life. So some of them, they would have read, you know, everything I've written. They would quote me back oh, yeah. to me. They would have references and yeah. be like, you know, you made such an astute point two years ago in this article. And I would think, oh, yeah, you're, you're smart, obviously. They're seductive. They're seductive. <laughs> exactly. And so then I saw what I was writing. And when I got some distance on it, my reaction was, oh my God, you know, how could I have written this? Because it's so flattering. You start whitewashing it. Yeah. You start, you know, you, you forget that you're dealing with rascals. We, so all, have, we all have that experience uh, writ small in our romantic lives, right? I think every, everybody has run across somebody very seductive who can manipulate you into falling in love with them. And so there are there are small time That's, con artists too, aren't they? Aren't there? Absolutely. And you know what? I actually um, I think that falling in love and someone manipulating you into that is a perfect illustration for people who don't understand how it is that smart people fall for con artists, how they don't see the red flags, how, you know, they don't listen to reason. And what I always say to those people is, well, think of a romantic relationship because yeah. that's what it is. You are emotional. And as soon as you're emotional, you stop thinking rationally. So imagine your best friend starts dating someone new and it gets really intense really quickly. And so you actually say to them, hey, you know, do you, maybe you want to slow down. There seem to be some red flags. You know, here are some things that maybe you want to pay attention to. What does your best friend answer? Does your best friend say, oh, thank you so much for no. bringing this to my attention? <laughs> <laughs> they 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 say, "Are you kidding? You don't want me to be happy." Yes, and and you don't know, and you don't know him. If you knew <laughs> him, you would exactly. love him, and or her. We should say it's yeah, it goes exactly. both directions. Um, exactly, exactly, and that is someone falling for a con artist. Precisely what happens? Wow. We now that you're saying this, I see con artists all over. <laughs> in our lives. And it's not always bad, but any, any great salesman or saleswoman is somewhat of a con artist. Uh, and, and of course, an ethical person would say, well, I want to make, I want to make everybody happy. I want to make sure that they have a win and I have a win. But um, so few of us really have that <laughs> other person's interests at heart, do we? Really, let's be honest. <laughs> No, that's that's true. And, you know, one of the things I have to say is that, um, you know, you see you see people in a lot of legitimate professions who 
who resemble con artists. Yeah. And some of them really are con artists and some of them aren't. And at the bottom line to me is intention. Was your intention malicious or not? Right. You know, are you going into this with the intent to deceive and take advantage or are you going into it with a more benign sort of worldview? Yeah. And if you're more benign, then I'm not going to call you a con artist because if I do, then all of a sudden I'm calling all lawyers, all businessmen, all advertisers, all marketers, right. Right. all journalists. I'm calling everyone a con artist and then the term stops meaning anything right. so that malicious intention is incredibly important do have to point out uh, i know you were on bill maher and uh, he asked you <laughs> is donald trump a con artist <laughs> um and i i think i did a. Uh, well, I tried to do a nice job of not answering directly and saying he has a, a lot of a lot of characteristics of a con artist. Um, although I did slip up and call him a psychopath by mm. mistake. Whoops! <laughs> so that was a faux well, pas. Well, but on this my is part. important, and uh, I think as a, as a psychologist, you know this. It's very tempting for us, especially in the uh, media, to uh, uh, amateur armchair psychologize people. Exactly. Exactly. And that's why I try to be very careful because you can't actually diagnose someone without yeah. meeting them. That no no clinical psychologist would ever do that. Right. That's very unprofessional and irresponsible. And so I tried to my best to say, look, Donald Trump exhibits a lot of characteristics of psychopathy. He exhibits a lot of characteristics of narcissism. He is definitely Machiavellian. That doesn't need a clinical diagnosis. That's not a clinical but term. But probably every politician is. I mean... Exactly. Exactly. But every politician is. Right. And to be perfectly honest, think about, you know, in terms of narcissism, I think he goes over the line into clinical narcissism, narcissistic personality disorder. Right. But every politician, especially presidential candidates, you have to be narcissistic. I mean... It's the height of ego to think that you can be the president of the United States. Right. And I should point out that anybody who has a, is a show host and hosts their own show on television yeah. or radio <laughs> probably is just as diagnosable. But the issue, and you, you really said it perfectly, is intent. And you can, you, it's very hard to understand or know somebody's intent. Yes, that's exactly right. Um, and until we can get into someone's head, we can't definitively answer that question unless there's evidence for it. So one of the things that um, I point out about Donald Trump is if he's convicted of fraud, if one of the lawsuits against right. him, especially against Trump University, actually ends up going against him and we have that conviction, then we'll be able to say definitively he's a con artist because we will have actual legal proof that he perpetrated a knowing fraud um, because the legal proof is actually right. quite similar to the psychological proof. Until that moment, we can't know his intention. You, excellent article in The New Yorker uh, from the March issue um, talking about this in uh, in great mm -hmm. detail, and I highly I highly recommend it. And I think it is online, which is uh, which mm -hmm. is which is great. All of the New Yorker is online. Isn't I should great? give a little spiel for the magazine. <laughs> Hallelujah! I pay for a subscription, but you make a good point. You probably don't have to. You can read so much well, of it. You, all you of actually, your great you actually have to. Oh, you do. You have to. It's it's paywalled. Oh, okay. Yes. Oh, good. Yes. And I don't feel so bad reading it. No, um, no, but you can read it all online. <laughs> I know. I know. It's awesome. Uh, so. Um, I guess one of the keys, and you mentioned this in the in the Trump article, is even when we discover that we've been conned, we often don't want to admit it. And uh, if, if, for instance, we elected a con man as president, he might end up being the most beloved president of all time because we just don't want to admit it. That's absolutely right. And a lot of people ask me, you know, well, how many con artists are there? How many of them are men? How many of them are women? And I say, I don't have a clue because the vast majority of them have never been caught. And w one of the reasons is people are embarrassed. And um, you and I talked a little while ago about, um, you know, how we tend to look down on victims of right. con artists. And so they don't want that reputation. They don't want people saying those things about them. Um, and so they just don't say anything. But the other part of it is a lot of people don't realize that they've fallen for a con. They think it's bad luck. You know, they, they just rationalize it away to such an extent that you often have people falling for the exact same con multiple times. Well, and it's in Silicon Valley. Um, I could think of a couple of unicorns <laughs> where there's some real question about, you know, whether the, the uh, I'll mention, I'm not, it's, I, I, the jury's still out, but Theranos uh, and Elizabeth uh, Holmes, the founder, uh, partly we created that story because it was such a great story. We wanted it to be true. 
That's absolutely right. And I think that often happens where people stop asking questions because it seems it's so good and it's such a compelling narrative. Con artists love this. They are the best storytellers in the world because they know that we are all suckers for a good story. And if the story is good enough, we don't question it. We don't see logical inconsistencies. We want to believe it. So you have things like Theranos and you are absolutely right. The jury's out. We have no idea idea whether that will end up being a con. But then you have things we know are cons, like Lance Armstrong. How many years did Boy. he fight successfully against his doping allegations because the story was too good to be, you know, too good to disbelieve. Right. It was too good to be true, but we wanted it to be true so much that we just didn't listen to anyone who said otherwise. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we had to be forced to believe that one. Exactly. And even now, I actually almost got booed off stage when I was doing an event in Texas when I mentioned Lance Armstrong as a con artist. Wow. To this day, they say he is not a con artist. Everyone dopes. You know, he was just, and I said, oh my God, you bought his story. You bought his <laughs> arguments. This is, <laughs> you are being his voice pieces. Yeah. Um, but people got really, really mad at me. Let's uh, take a break and talk about the uh, 419 scam and the history of the 419 scam. And after I read your article, even more people came forward and say, you know, it even goes back earlier than that, before Bill. So we'll talk about that when we come back. We have a great guest. I wish we had hours with you. We only have a little bit more time. <laughs> Maria Konnikova is the author of a book that uh, now is a must read on my bookshelf, The Confidence Game, and why we fall for it every time. We'll have more in just a moment. A word from Triangulate, no, Curiosity Stream. This is Triangulation. I'm telling you about Curiosity Stream. I love this. And we've already heard from, I see this on Twitter all the time. In fact, today somebody tweeted me, thank you for telling me about Curiosity Stream. This is awesome. What is it? Well, it was created by John Hendricks. He's the founder of Discovery, uh, the Discovery Channel, Discovery Communications. It's the world's first ad-free, non-fiction streaming service. So if you love documentaries, if you love science and technology, if you love interviews, if you love lectures, this is for you. 1,400 titles, 600 hours of content, more being added all the time. It's available worldwide, by the way, almost, almost every country, including the country you're living in right now. And you can watch it on the web, but you can also watch it on Roku. They have a Roku app. They have Android, iOS. They have a Chrome. You can use Chromecast on their apps. They have an app for Amazon Fire, for the Kindle. They have Apple TV. And their library includes many of the shows you want to watch right now, like Stephen Hawking's Universe, Next World featuring Michio Kaku. He was on the show. He's awesome. The Human Face of Big Data, Rick Smolin. He was also on the show. I mean, this is really, I mean, these are people that you would be watching on Triangulation, right? Oh, look at this. A documentary about Lincoln's last night. <gasps> I love history. I love this kind of stuff. And by the way, you see how good that looks? They got the, one of the largest 4K libraries on the internet, 50 hours of 4K content. So if you just got a new TV and you're looking for some, you know, to show it off, some great content, this is the place. They have monthly plans, they have annual plans, and it starts at just $2.99 a month. That is so affordable, less than a cup of coffee for, to fill your mind with great stuff. But we have an even better deal for you. If you go to curiositystream.com slash twit, and sign up right now with the offer code TWIT. You'll get not one month, but two months free. 60 days free. Curiosity stream. Remember that. Dot com slash TWIT. Use the offer code TWIT. Tell your friends and family. I know there's people in your circle of friends or your family members who love to learn. My father-in-law, rest his soul, he would have loved this channel. He was a science teacher. He would have, he would have lived on this channel. Popo, I wish you were around and I could tell you about this. CuriosityStream.com slash twit. Use the offer code TWIT for two months free. We're talking to Maria Konnikova. She's the author of The Confidence Game. Why we fall for it every time. Her first job out of college working uh, for uh, the great Charlie Rose show. And you were back on Charlie Rose a couple of weeks ago. That must have felt pretty good. Um, it, it certainly did. I mean, I had to. I had to work hard for that. I did. I did not get to go on his show after my first book. He made me write a second one. Oh man! But he must have so, been pretty proud of you when you came back, right? He I absolutely hope. was. Yeah, he yeah. absolutely was. He and I. You know, I, I'm very grateful to him. He's been a wonderful mentor throughout the years. Nice.
So this is in the book. You talk about the 419 scam, sometimes called 419 scam, sometimes the Nigerian prince scam. And there is not one person watching who hasn't received an email, probably today, from somebody saying, "I, you know, I'm dying. I'm my will. I want you in my will, but you need to help me." But what is one of the reasons it sucks you in is it's not immediately apparent that they want anything from you. They just that's absolutely right. And in fact, this yep. started as a pen pal. Tell us about the original, uh, not, uh, whatever, a Nigerian prince scam for one of a better name. So, yeah, no, the original Nigerian prince was uh, someone named Bill Morrison. Um, all of a sudden, um, ads appeared in newspapers around the country, and this was in the 1800s. 1800s, folks! Uh, 120 yes. years ago! <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> Um, so it was from a Nigerian prince and he said, you know, I, I'm a prince, um, I live in Nigeria and I just need friends. I'm oh. lonely. Oh. It was really heartbreaking. So heartbreaking that newspapers ran this ad for free. Um, and it included his address and people started writing to him. And they developed a correspondence because all he wanted were some American pen pals. You know, how, how sweet is that? Oh. And, and so eventually, after a few exchanges, he, he would say something along the lines of, you know, I have so many jewels. I don't have anything to do with them. You know, what, what am I going to do? To me, they're worthless baubles. Why don't I send you some? In exchange, all I need is $4 and a pair of pants. <laughs> <laughs> Now, uh, that pair of pants gets me gets me every time. So What a strange I'll, thing to ask I for. Know. Exactly, but you know what? It also makes it seem more re more realistic. He needs pants, you know. Okay. Yeah. He's Nigerian, maybe they don't have pants there. I don't know. Exactly. Who knows? Who knows how they do it over in Nigeria? Right. And <laughs> this is remember pre-internet. You right. can't uh, 1880s can't folks. Figure it out. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and so what ended up happening was people sent him pants. He got so many pants and lots of money. But then they never got their jewels in exchange. Oh. And so all of a sudden the post office started getting complaints. You know, where are my jewels? And so they started looking into this because this is mail fraud potentially. Um, and so they dug into it. And finally, they found the perpetrator, Bill Morrison, um, and they ended up not pressing any charges because he was a 16-year-old boy. 16 years old. It was even younger when he started, I think, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh, um, he was even younger. This, this went on for quite a while. <laughs> it's like a little kid. It's like 14-year-old kid. He's doing this. Exactly. And was exactly. he, do you think he was a con artist? I mean, he, did he want money or was it, I mean... I guess we'll never know. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think I think we pro he probably wanted money. I right. mean, the four dollars. Think about it. What's the pants the time, though? What's the with the pants? I have no, I have no <laughs> idea. I mean, I want to write a book just about the pants called I, Bill Morrison's I, pants. <laughs> <laughs> but that I guess that makes it more plausible. Somebody in the chat room is saying, yeah. "Oh, because because the pants makes it credible." If you said, "Just exactly. send me money." That would sound like he was greedy, but it just... I mean, yeah, it would sound like alarm bells. And pants and $4, that's like a request from a friend. You right. know, send me some pants. Maybe right. the $4 right. will help cover my costs when I send you the jewels. Who knows? But if you think about it, if he has like 100 pen pals, $400 back then in the 1880s, oh, yeah. can you imagine? that's a lot of money. It's tons of money. It's a huge amount, especially for a 16-year-old boy. What are you but this gonna, shows you, you gonna... con artists are kind of nativist psychologists. They are... Without studying a, a lick of psychology, they know the pants thing is, is actually brilliant, right? And, and they know somehow that that's going to work. They're brilliant. They are, they often, are they often smarter than the average bear? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. They are. And this is, this is why, you know, when you asked me earlier, what is it about? And I said, I think it's about power. Um, because a lot of them, they're really smart. And being a con artist is a lot of work. I mean, as Mark Twain said, you know, don't ever tell lies because that way you don't have to try right. to remember what you told to whom. Um, and this is something very similar. It's a lot of effort to actually live a lie all the time. And so they could have been incredibly successful at so many legitimate careers. And yet this is what they chose right. or it chose them. And so, yeah, they're incredibly smart. And um, I think that 
When you see how many of them had the opportunity to be in legitimate careers, you wonder, you say, hey, you made much less money in the long term than you would have had you just been a legitimate um, you know, businessman. And I say businessman broadly, you know, legitimate career person. Um, and yet, you know, to them, they want to con. They love that deception. I wonder what happened to Bill Morrison. I would have loved to, you know, catch up with him 20 years later right. to see if there was a second act to that story. One thinks there was. Do con men ever get cured? Um, hardly ever. So Frank Abagnale, the star of Catch Me If You Can. He or I guess pretty normal. Our he didn't try he, to take my wallet yeah, when I met him. <laughs> so he he's an exception. But I have to say, Catch Me If You Can makes him seem like he was just this incredible con artist. He was caught after two years, yeah. which makes him not very good. Right. Someone like Damara did this for decades and decades and decades. And so I think Abagnale just was kind of, he's an exception. He was doing a lot of it on a lark, and now he helps the government um, figure out right. how do you catch others like him. But he's really an exception. Most con artists, I would say the vast majority, um, stick with it their whole life until until they're in jail. But most of them never get caught. Most of them are never in jail. So in some ways, we only know about the worst con artists. Right, the ones that aren't very good, right? The rest yeah, of the them get elected get to, to high office. So, uh, <laughs> so, um, is the internet a golden era for the con? Absolutely. So going back to, to Mr. Abagnale, he was actually recently asked um, whether he could do what he did today, because presumably, you know, there'd be so many technological safeguards. How in the world could you impersonate, you know, a pilot? Right. Um, and he laughed. He laughed at the interview question. He said, are you kidding me? It's a million times easier. Technology is a con artist's best friend. And that's for several reasons. First, how easy is it to impersonate someone when you have the internet? Because we now trust the internet. So imagine, you know, I set up a Facebook account. I set up a Twitter account. I edit Wikipedia. One of the con artists I write about in the book actually edited Wikipedia pages because he pretended to be a British aristocrat. And he would put himself <laughs> into lineages. He would actually put fake entries, just tiny edits. So someone checking up on him, um, would go there, they would see, oh, he's legit. You know, here wow. he is in the peerage. And it took forever for editors to catch something like that because no one's really looking for it. Um, and so all of a sudden, you're an aristocrat. You have all of these social connections. You're connected to other aristocrats. Um, people don't really check up. You are somebody new. So that's one part of it. The other part is that we feel like technology protects us when it actually makes us much more vulnerable. So we think, oh, you know, there are spam filters. There are all these guards against fraud. But what we end up doing is, first of all, we put so much information online, so much personal information, you know, not just Facebook, but when you're checking in places on Foursquare, when you're tweeting about places, oh, you know, just had a great dinner at this place. All of a sudden, someone knows who your friends are. They know what your preferences are. They know what kinds of foods you like, which makes it much easier to pretend to be like the kind of person you'd be friends with, much easier to break into your social network. The kind of reconnaissance work that used to take months now takes days and you don't even have to be particularly tech savvy. And so we make ourselves incredibly vulnerable by revealing so much personal stuff. And we might not even realize that we're doing anything. You know, we might do something like a wedding registry. All of a sudden, a con artist knows, hey, this person's getting married. Big life change ahead. This is what kinds of things they're registered for. This is where their wedding is. Okay, I'm ready. Here's my con. Yeah. You know, yeah. and those are things that people just do all the time without even realizing that this is a point of information. And by the way, those wedding registries stay online for years and years Oy. and years. Oh, boy. Uh, I wish we had more time. Maria Konnikova is the author of a great book that you must read and I'm going to read and we should all read because what's interesting <laughs> is a lot of these internet scams are just rehashed classics, most of them, including the Nigerian Prince yeah. scam. So if you read the book, you're at least a little bit more uh, armed and you'll, uh, I, you know, the confidence game, why we fall for it every time Maria Konnikova, uh, our guest. What a pleasure talking to you, and I would love to talk more because you're writing in The New Yorker. Every single piece you write, we could do a show on. I mean, it's just fascinating, <laughs> like what your tweets say about you and more. So, <laughs> Thank you so it, much. It's a real pleasure to talk to somebody who's such an astute observer of the modern condition. Thank you, Maria. I appreciate it.
Thank you our, so much our, for having me. Our show is every Monday, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1800 UTC. If you want to watch live, please do be in the chat room. Join me for the conversation. If not, of course, on-demand audio and video, always available after the fact at twit.tv slash TRI or wherever you get your podcasts, which is, you know, pretty much anywhere, including all the Twit apps on every single platform. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, next week, uh, we're going to talk to Dan Lyons, the fake Steve Jobs, about his book, Disrupted, about being in the, a startup, and it's hysterical. Of course, he's also a writer now uh, for uh, the Silicon Valley TV show. Dan will be our guest next week on Triangulation. I hope we'll see you then. Bye-bye. Thank you.